Hello everyone. What a great occasion this is. Dean Minow, fa faculty, friends, family, members of the class of 2013. Now, everybody's mixed together happily, uh, but could everybody who's actually a member of the class of 2013 raise their hand? Let's, let's see you there. there. Look at that, that's terrific. Yeah. Now, as, as I look out at you, I think of my first day at Harvard Law School. Uh, 8.30 in the morning, over in Pound Hall, Alan Dershowitz for criminal law, and he looked out at 140 of us, there were 140 of us in, in sections in those days, and he said this, he looked at us and he said, based on the history of Harvard Law School alumni, more of you will be criminal defendants than criminal lawyers. <laughs> so on that happy note, um, most of you will not be criminal defendants this week, I think, so please do enjoy um, your, your commencement week. Now, it's customary to say at occasions like this that it's a great honor to be here, but it really is uh, a great honor. I love Harvard Law School. Um, I, this was the greatest, richest educational experience of my life. I met some of my closest friends here. As a journalist, I have returned again and again to learn more from my friends and new friends on the faculty. This is an astonishing and fabulous place, and I hope um, you recognize that as much as I do. Um, I sometimes think of my life as a journalist as that of a perpetual 1L. To me, the 1L experience um, was the most interesting in law school, uh, and I try to write and talk about the most interesting stuff um, that's out there. Uh, I arrived in the fall of 1983. Uh, as I said, I had Alan Dershowitz for criminal law, Todd Rakoff for contracts, Mort Horowitz for torts, Frank Michaelman for property, and Abe Shays of blessed memory for civil procedure. It was a pretty great lineup then and as it is now. And I remember individual classes um, like it was yesterday. Um, Mort the tort on Vincent's versus Lake Erie. Todd Rakoff on Hawkins versus McGee, the hairy hand. Alan Dershowitz on Alan Dershowitz. Um, I was just as fortunate as a uh, 2L and a 3L. Um, this is a good time, I hope, to pay tribute to my teacher, later my friend, and always my inspiration, Anthony Lewis. I took his class here uh, at Harvard on freedom of the press. I read his columns, his books, Tony invented modern coverage of the Supreme Court, the field in which I now work. Tony was an informed and in humane voice about the Constitution for decades. His loss was a great one earlier this year. And finally, I'd like to mention someone who is still very much with us. Um, constitutional law with Larry Tribe changed my life. I do what I do now because of what I learned in Larry's class. I only wish the current Supreme Court learned as much from Larry as I did, um, although he taught several of them. Um, I even remember the homework assignment for the first day of constitutional law with Professor Tribe. The assignment was, as I suspect it still is, read the Constitution of the United States. He said you could read it during the commercials, and it turns out you can. Um, this is a class day speech, not a commencement speech, but I still think I'm allowed to give you some advice. So here it is. Before you do anything else this week, I hope you say thank you a lot. Um, you should say thank you to your parents if you're lucky enough to have them with you. And you should, you should always say thank you to your parents, but especially this week and especially if they, hate, they helped pay for your adventure here at Harvard Law School. Um, say thank you to your professors. Like me, you were very lucky to have them. Say thank you to everyone else who works here at Harvard. The people who make the coffee, who make the trains run out time, who clean the floors. Be sure to say thank you to your friends, relatives, spouses, and significant others who put up with you um, during these past three years. There are few people in the world more self-absorbed than law students though I suspect journalists are right up there. And my guess is uh, that you, during your law school career, you tax the patience of the people in your life more than once. 
So say thank you to them as well. And please accept, again, my congratulations. Now, I, um, I have spent most of my career, or certainly the last uh, decade plus of it, covering the Supreme Court. And um, one thing that I have to admit, I have developed, um, I developed a favorite justice on the court. Uh, and that was David Souter. I love David Souter, not just because he was one of five, five graduates of Harvard Law School on the court, actually six, if you count Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who spent two of three years here. Um, and uh, Souter um, was so, and is so, delightfully odd as a human being. Um, Justice Souter uh, does not have a computer. He does not have a cell phone. He does not like electric light. He moves his chair around his chambers across the, around, over the course of the day to catch the sunlight. He eats the same thing for lunch every day. He has an apple, he has a cup of yogurt and an apple including the core. Um, but the, the great thing about Justice Souter is that in addition to being a Supreme Court justice, he recognizes the peculiar place that the Supreme Court holds in, the, in American life because at one level, the court is very well known, but the justices themselves are actually pretty obscure and largely unrecognized uh, in public. And Souter recognized this and sometimes had a little fun with it. And I'll give you an example. For, for reasons that remain obscure, David Souter and Stephen Breyer are frequently mistaken for each other. Now, if you know what they look like, they really don't look anything alike, but it happens to both of them uh, fairly often to this day. And one time, not too long ago, Justice Souter, as he often did, was driving from Washington to his home in New Hampshire, and he stopped here in Massachusetts to get something to eat at a little restaurant. And he's sitting there, and a guy comes up, to, a couple comes up to him, and the guy says, I know you. You're on the Supreme Court, right? He says, yeah. He says, you're Stephen Breyer, right? And Souter didn't want to embarrass the fellow in front of his wife, so he says, yes, I'm Stephen Breyer. And they chatted for a little while, and he says, well, well, well Justice Breyer, what's the best thing about being on the Supreme Court? He thought for a minute, and he said, I'd have to say it's the privilege of serving with David Souter. <laughs> now, how can you love that? I not love that guy, right? So, you know, as, as I was preparing to come here, I was thinking about the Supreme Court, in, and, and I thought about the Supreme Court in 1986 when I graduated. And think about these justices who were on the court. It's not the whole court, but uh, Warren Berger, Lewis Powell, Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Kennedy, and John Paul Stevens. Now, you could quibble, but I would submit to you that all of them can be described as moderate Republicans. Um, Anthony Kennedy is still on the court, but the notion of moderate Republicans has disappeared from the Supreme Court just as it has disappeared from American life. And that is really the subject I have found, I've coming back to over and over again in my writing. Um, the change in American politics that the change in the Republican Party has brought. And, and really the turning point, I think, um, at least in terms of the Supreme Court, was something that I really have devoted many years of my life to studying and writing about, and that's the court's decision in Bush v. Gore in 2000. Uh, in 2000. You know, Justice um, Scalia, also a distinguished graduate of this school, you know, he does a lot of public speaking, and he often gets a kind of hostile question about Bush v. Gore. And he always says the same thing when, um, when he's asked. He says, oh, get over it. Well, just speaking for myself, I'm not yet over uh, Bush v. Gore. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I, before I wrote my two Supreme Court books, I wrote a book called Too Close to Call about the recount in, in Florida. And um, I, for that book, I tried to interview Al Gore, right? I mean, you, you want to write a book about the recount? You certainly want to interview Al Gore. I tried everything I could. I wrote, I called, I worked every connection I had. Gore wouldn't talk to me. I just didn't, he just didn't want to relive the experience, so I wrote the book without his cooperation. Well, just by coincidence, while I was working on The Nine, I met Al Gore at a social occasion, and uh, I told him I was working on The Nine after Too Close to Call, you know, and I said, you know, Mr. Vice President, I'm now working on my second book 
about Bush v. Gore, I said, I think I must be the biggest Bush v. Gore junkie in the world. And he said to me, you may be second. Um, which I think, you know, you got to give him a nod on that uh, because he, um, he um, had a bit of a uh, bigger stake in the outcome than I did. Um, since, um, since Bush v. Gore, um, the court has turned over uh, somewhat, four, four justices have left, and um, it, it's worth pausing to consider the last three justices to leave the Supreme Court. John Paul Stevens, uh, um, Ruth, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, and David Souter. Um, three more different people you will never recognize. Uh, you have um, a uh, tall, outgoing, charismatic former politician from Arizona, a um, shy, reclusive bachelor from New Hampshire, a savvy antitrust lawyer from Chicago. So different in personality, but so similar in that all three of the last justices were moderate Republicans who left the court completely alienated from the modern Republican Party. And I think that really tells you a lot about what's happened in, in our politics, both in the broader politics and on the Supreme Court. And the court now has five Republicans and four Democrats. And with due respect to the people who teach constitutional law here at Harvard Law School, I think that tells you most of what you need to know about the contemporary Supreme Court, that there are five Republicans and four Democrats. And as, as you go out into the law, one of the things I find um, a little sad when I talk to other graduates of Harvard Law School, and, you know, and, and they, you know, I'm, we're talking about the Supreme Court, he says, they, they say, gosh, you know, I don't really follow that stuff much anymore. It's interesting to hear about it again. And I hope as you go out into the world and you're going to be practicing law and you're going to be busy and very few of you probably at least initially will be practicing law before the United States Supreme Court. It's worth keeping an eye out on these issues and it's worth still caring about it because it's important to you, it's important to the country, it's important to the world and um, it's also interesting and so I, I hope you do. So all 700 plus of you are now Harvard lawyers. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about what, um, where you've been and where you may be going. By and large, uh, you got here because you were really good students. You got good grades, you got great grades, or else you wouldn't be here at all. Uh, and the vast majority of you continued to do well uh, once you got here. That's great. I'm a big fan of good grades. But I'm going to suggest to you that the skills of a student are of somewhat less use to you once you get out into what is sometimes called uh, the real world. Students follow rules. Students complete assignments. The job of students, in part at least, is to please their teachers. Now I realize I'm exaggerating a little, but basically I think I'm right. Students do what they're told. And I think that might be especially true of law students. After all, law is basically a series of rules and you come here to start to learn them. The recruiting process here at Harvard reinforces these tendencies. The law school runs a conveyor belt and it's easy to get on. It can look like just another example of following the rules to sign on and sign up. And you can do that and many of you did and that's good. And it's not my intention to criticize recruiting or even going to law firms. Um, I work in cable news, so I am not afraid to say things that are painfully obvious. Here's one. 2013 is not the greatest time in history to graduate from law school. The legal economy is changing, and it's hard to think that it's getting better. There are no guarantees anymore, not even for Harvard lawyers. It's not a sign-on and sign-up world anymore. The legal world you're entering is very different from the one I joined in 1986, and it's very different from the one you'll face in 10 years, much less 30. Here's something to ponder. As I think about my classmates in law school, today I don't think one of us is doing what we expected when we graduated. Well, except for maybe one, but Elena's in sort of a separate category. Um, you know, since we're on the side, I guess I sort of have to pay tribute to my class. You know, Elena and I were in section together, uh, and we were in study group together. And, um, you know, she 
did not do well in torts. I remember the day, uh, the day we got our grades at the Hark in, uh, in, in our mailboxes. You know, I wonder, I was thinking, I wonder why they gave us our grades in mailboxes and didn't simply email them to us. Oh, that's because email hadn't been invented yet. Uh, but so yes, we were standing there and Elena got her grades and she got a very disappointing grade to her in torts. And I said to her, I do remember this, I said, you know, in the larger scheme of things, I really don't think it's gonna matter very much. Was I right or what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, except for Justice Kagan, everyone else found that life had other plans and I expect um, that will be true um, for you as well. Even if you go to the biggest law firm in the world, you are going to have to invent your own career. You're going to have to make it up as you go along. And I suggest to you that's really a very good thing. My classmates who have made it up as they've gone along have by and large been the happiest and most satisfied of law school graduates. Let me give you an example. When I was in law school, a friend of mine, he was a couple years ahead of me, took on a novel subject for his third year paper. He wrote a paper, and this was like 1985 or so, that put forth the idea that gay people should have a constitutional right to get married. Now, he wasn't the very person, first person to think this up, but he was close to it, and the idea of same-sex marriage was very far from the conventional wisdom at the time. Lots of people thought the idea was frankly weird or worse. Well, my friend's name is Evan Wolfson, and after he graduated, he was a prosecutor for a few years. We worked together in Washington for a while, and then he became the founder and executive director of Freedom to Marry. Today, here in Langdell, there is an exhibit devoted to Evan's third year paper. I assure you, there is no exhibit devoted to my third year paper, for example. But while we were at a H here at HLS, the placement office did not have any jobs for careers in advocating same-sex marriage. But Evan invented one, and the results are obvious to us all. He's lucky, and we're lucky for it. My own career reflects a strange dichotomy between the world we've long known and the world that will become. I'm fortunate to have two jobs. I work at The New Yorker and I'm a legal analyst at CNN. The New Yorker is one of the oldest magazines in the country. My editor probably wouldn't like me to say this, but we basically do what we've always done. We write long articles about people and things in the news. Fortunately, about two million people a week find this worth reading. My other job is very different. CNN was born just as I was graduating from college. Cable television is a little older. There was no such thing as a television legal analyst until about 1995. You can credit or blame O.J. Simpson for that. So I make my living in part in a job that didn't even exist uh, when I went to law school. I'm sure that's true for many parents here, and I am certain it is going to be true for you. Even if these jobs existed, what we do and how we do it is completely different from what went before. You've, understand, you've undoubtedly heard in the news media that there is currently an oversupply of lawyers in the country. There are just too many of you, of us. I think I've said it myself. But on reflection, I don't think that's really accurate. In the years since the economic crisis hit, it's become quite apparent that there are actually not enough lawyers out there, at least in the right places. Here are some melancholy facts. A woman, seeking a woman seeking a restraining order is 83% of those with lawyers secured an order, while only 32% of those who didn't have lawyers got them. Tenants represented by lawyers were three to 19 times more likely to beat their landlords in eviction cases. Or foreclosures, people facing foreclosures and eviction are dramatically more likely to be able to keep their homes if they are represented by a lawyer. Now, it's easy to make fun of lawyers. I do it more, myself more than occasionally. But these statistics show the value that lawyers can provide in the real world. You can do it part-time while you're working at a firm. You can be that lawyer. You should be that lawyer. This is life-changing work. And I mean that in two ways. It's obviously life-changing for your clients. 
but it can be life-changing for you too. Everyone wants to be paid well. I know that I certainly do. But there are other satisfactions that we get from our work, to feel needed, to feel accomplishment, to believe that our work matters. Being a lawyer gives you a rare chance to experience that kind of success. And the more you feel that kind of success, the better you'll get at your work. It's a kind of virtuous circle. But you have to go out and look for it in the first place. You have to take the kind of chances that Evan Wolfson took. You all start with a huge advantage. You're Harvard lawyers. That gets people's attention from Cambridge to Cambodia. And let's be honest here, since we're talking just in the family. Lots of lawyers, especially new lawyers, are having a hard time getting jobs these days. And even though I know that the days of wine and roses, like when I graduated from law school, are over, that's really not that much so true here at Harvard. People want you. You all can find jobs. And frankly, I think the reason you came here is you wanted something more than just getting a job. You know that with the enormous, well-earned gift of a Harvard Law degree comes a real responsibility. Now you have to go out and make that great, de great degree work for yourself and for all of us. I'm confident that you will, and I wish you the best of luck and congratulations on this happy week. Thank you. Sorry, just going on. So that concludes Harvard Law School class day for the class of 2013. We would like to thank Dean Minow for hosting us today and Jeffrey Tubin for acting as class day speaker. We'd also like to offer a special thanks to the Dean of Students Office, uh, Dean Ellen Cosgrove and Meg uh, DeMarco for organizing this event today and the events tomorrow. And we would like to congratulate all the graduates and to thank the family and friends who are here to celebrate with us. And as a reminder, we are going to be having a reception beginning immediately to our right over on Jarvis Field. We invite you all to come, mingle, make merry with your friends, your family, and our professors. And as a reminder to our graduates and our families, we look forward to commencement exercises beginning in the morning. Bright and early, we march down at 7.15. There is a sunrise breakfast. And I can be the first to say I am looking so forward to it and being with all of you all. Thank you.